Here. Here. Do you want to begin again so it's recorded? Oh, it wasn't on? Your mic was not on. Shoot. Take two. All right. <laughs> Let's call this regular monthly meeting to order. Sounds better. <clears throat> um, of the Scarborough Sanitary District. It's Thursday, May 26, 2022. Let's do the roll call. Let's start the other side. Paul Rodriguez. Here. Ruth Summers. Here. Jason Greenleaf. Here. Ben McDougal. Here. Mike Stein. Here. I'm Chairman Nick Rico. Joe Carroll will be here shortly. All right. Approval of the minutes from the April monthly meeting. I'll entertain a motion. Thank you, Jason. Second. Thank you, Ben. Any corrections? Barring none, all in favor? None opposed. Thank you. Superintendent's report. A copy of the monthly report of operations for the month of April is included in your packet. Our average effluent flow for the month was 1.58 million gallons per day. Our effluent quality was well within our permitted limits. Within, uh, we averaged 98%. Thank you, Nick, for picking up that typo. Um, BOD removal and 89% total suspended solids removal uh, for the month with average concentrations of 21 and 4. A copy of the pump station flow for the month of April is included in your packet. No issues of concern were noted. Uh, Carl and Paul have completed the installation of the new Vapex unit in the Headworks building. We, are, we also added an ozone monitoring system with, uh, that will alarm if safe levels are exceeded. Uh, this will not only alarm locally, but through SCADA. Uh, in addition, we're, we will be uh, adding the H2S and the LEL meters to the SCADA uh, system also. Um, pump station one, the, uh, with regards to odor control, the Spice Cone uh, spring startup has uh, just happened this, this week. Uh, we've had four Generators, the PLCs uh, we have been identified um, to be obsolete and will need replacement. Um, the four of them, are the one at the wastewater treatment plant, pump station six, which is the big pump station on Old Neck, uh, 11, 5, and 23. That, that's actually five. Uh, the estimated cost is uh, for the treatment plant is about $30,000 in the remainder. Uh, I just got the estimate back is about, uh, brings it, that number up to about $100,000. For the two larger stations, uh, I think my recommendation will be, we'll move forward with, it, with that work. Uh, they, have in the, uh, they have shown signs of uh, um, potential failure in the near term. The, the other smaller units seem to be functioning fine. Um, for now, and so I'm probably going to recommend pushing those out for a little while on those items there. Um, let's see, Maple Lab service leak. Uh, BLD came to complete the repair that was budgeted on the gravity sewer service line uh, leak on Maple Lab. Unfortunately, they determined that they could not complete this work and re recommended a dig and replace approach. Uh, being 20 feet Deep. This is a very difficult and expensive task. I'm working with Risbera to develop an approach which will likely utilize vacuum excavation. Uh, currently, we are targeting late summer, early fall. Originally, I had budgeted $12,000 for this in situ repair. Currently, I'm estimating it at approximately a $50,000 dig and replace uh, uh, um, to get this work completed. But. Uh, with part of the work, Rosbear will be putting together a uh, budget estimate for that work. And that's uh, one, I, one I, other item I want to uh, highlight. Um, we have just actually uh, identified and um, 
processed a purchase order for a new asset management program uh, called FIX. It's a Rockwell-supported software program um, that is actually used in SACO, and they've had good luck with it. They enjoy it. Uh, and so we will be uh, purchasing that and starting to populate it with uh, the information that was gathered through, through that asset management project. And that's all I have with regards to my report. Any questions for the superintendent? I had a question about the Station 11 generator. As I recall, that station was built 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the PLC is on the generator itself, which is obsolete. Is it ready to fail? It's not ready to fail, nor showing signs of failure, but if it does fail, uh, the unit will have to, the, the replacement unit, um, it, it's not, you can't replace it in kind. It's a, it's a more complicated and complex process. It requires a lot of uh, pulling wires and new sensors and stuff like that. Uh -huh. Okay. Whereas the, gener the uh, PLC at the Headworks has uh, had some hiccups over the years. Um, with regards to that generator, that's a, a very large generator, uh, expensive, and the PLC's value is, you know, that, that generator to replace that's about $30,000, uh, and uh, the generator cost is probably uh, $300,000 for a 500 kW. Uh -huh. yeah. Whereas at the smaller stations, the, the ratio of the cost uh, gets very uh, elevated. The generators are probably for, uh, somewhere around forty-five, fifty thousand dollars, and the replacement cost for the PLC is running at twenty thousand dollars. It, it's it's a hard nut to swallow. Yes, uh, it especially is. when there there isn't any signs of uh, deterioration or malfunctioning uh, showing. Okay. And cool. a new PLC can fail just as easy as an old PLC. Yes, it can. <clears throat> All right. Any other questions? All right, correspondence. Uh, first on the list is from Casella, who uh, we are currently under contract with uh, to haul our sludge, haul and dispose of our sludge. Uh, Casella sent the district a letter outlining the cost increase due to the passing of LB 1911. With this fee increase, our sludge disposal costs will increase from our current rate of $87.30 36 cents per ton to $153.75 per ton starting the 1st of January 2023. I included a copy of the letter. They gave us two options. Um, one option was for a three year uh, lock in price uh, of that 153, and then also a five year option, which actually is a higher cost. Um, at this point, I, I, I plan on executing the three-year uh, contract unless I hear otherwise because it's a very um, unstable situation right now with regards to sludge disposal. It's, a very, it's developing and will continue to develop over the next number of years. Uh, next on the list is a discharge incident report on Maple Ave. On uh, Saturday, May 7th at 5.30, the district was notified of a sewer blockage on Maple Lab. The blockage resulted in two sanitary sewer overflows into two homes located at 68 and 78 Maple Lab. The block blockage was cleared by 8.15, and the homeowners were uh, told to contact service for, for mitigation, and, which they have done and, and completed. Our insurance carrier was uh, contacted and is working directly with the homeowners to, uh, um, with regards to managing the cost of mitigation. And we also had a, a second discharge incident report at pump station number three on, on uh, Saturday, May 14th at 9.30. We received a call of a high wet well alarm from pump station number three, which is the one located at Wild Duck Campground. Upon inspection, the operator found both pumps plugged, resulting in a sanitary sewer overflow from the manholes adjacent to the pump station. 
The on-call operator called in another operator for assistance and had the station back online by noon. Debris in the pumps included pieces of brick. Consequently, we investigated and found an upstream manhole with a deteriorating invert at the discharge of the uh, Church Street siphon. We are currently evaluating options for a repair of that invert. And that is what I have for correspondence. Any questions on the correspondence? Go ahead, Ben. The, the, we had one recently at Wild Duck Campground, right? Are, are these related? Uh, they very well could be. Uh, we had a plug in the, the sewer line, not in the pump station, uh, just uh, uh, right in front of the pump station. And, and the overflow occurred in the same two manholes that occurred during that period of time. So my guess is that the debris from that, uh, we didn't know what the, the debris were when we cleared it. They, they, uh, some things clear quickly, and uh, we weren't able to identify what the cause of it was. But uh, now that they, we were able, we pulled the bricks out of the, the um, pumps, I suspect they were related to one another. Okay. Any more questions? Go ahead, Joe. Going back to the Casella memo, mm -hmm. is it worth? Is, is there another option to go back? to a bid for other people or go back to our previous options or operations, I should say. Uh, I have looked at other alternatives in, uh, um, in uh, haulers. Uh, at, the, at the previous bid, there were only uh, two contractors that actually gave us prices for disposal. Uh, the, the second one used to dispose of our sludge. Um, com they composted it in New Hampshire, actually. They, they did give me a call and uh, gave me a price for disposal, and that price uh, was actually $165 per ton. Any more questions? Yeah, Go ahead. Oh. I'm assuming going back to our previous composting operations, probably still cost prohibitive. Uh, well, if we went back to composting, LD 1911 actually requires uh, all municipal uh, sludge generated compost to be land uh, to be landfilled anyway. So we would actually be increasing the quantity of material we would have to landfill, and so it would actually drive up our costs. That's our options are extremely limited right now. That's what I thought. Thank you, Jason. You have a question. Joe just asked it. Thank you. Uh -huh. Good to know. Great minds think alike. All right. Um, I would actually entertain a motion to suspend the rules and add another item agenda on, call it new business, 7D, key bank fraud protection. You forgot the old business. There is no old business, and I can entertain a motion now. It doesn't matter <laughs> when I entertain it. So moved. Thank you, Jason. Second. Anyone else? Thank you, Ben. All in favor? None opposed. All right. Old business, there is none. New business. It is the time for the audit report. OK. Uh, well, let Associates uh, has completed our annual audit. They will present the report to the board and will take questions regarding the audit. After which I will present our annual copies of both were included electronically in your packet. And just prior to the meeting, I did hand out the paper copies that was uh, delivered to me tonight. <coughs> With that, I'll, uh, Mike. Great. Thank, thank you for letting me come down here. It's been a few years, but um, it's great to be out and actually uh, addressing the trustees directly rather than through, through the Zoom meeting. But have to do what we have to do, I guess. Um, I have a PowerPoint, as you can see, set up, and, and there are copies that were handed out. So, um, you trust me. Stating your name for the folks. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. My name's Mike Dunn. I'm, I'm a partner with Willett & Associates, and I've been auditing um, Scarborough Sanitary District for over 15 years now. Um, again, the, the, the slideshow, 
we're going to go over a number of documents as a result of the audit, uh, one being the financial statements and then the, um, the governance letter. Um, I have my slides set up to summarize all this information and put it in a little bit different format that, that you can kind of see some trends over, over five-year periods. Um, so as I go through uh, these slides, we can definitely uh, use those, those different documents um, to follow through the presentation. Uh, if anybody has any questions as I'm presenting, you're certainly welcome to ask. I don't mind stopping and, and answering questions as we're going through the information. So the first slide I have is, is for new trustees, just to make sure everybody understands the purpose of the audit. Um, we, 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 do, we perform this audit annually. Uh, with, with the goals to um, actually provide an opinion on your financial statements. Um, having these financial statements with an opinion on it um, provides assurance to, to the readers of the financial statements. A couple other areas that we do is when, when we perform the audit and perform our procedures, we're reviewing the district's internal controls uh, at various areas. And um, if, we, if we come across any areas of improvement, we, can, we certainly advise management at that point of, of things they can do for changes. Um, the other thing we do is uh, periodically uh, new accounting standards and reporting standards are released. Um, and when these, when these accounting standards are released, we, we provide if it's, if it's required for the district to modify their reports or their accounting. Uh, for certain transactions based on these standards, we would uh, provide some technical assistance to implement those. So that's basically our three, three goals that we do as part of the audit. The next slide has to do with the governance letter. It's, you should have a copy of that attached. Um, it's, it's a three-page letter with some attachments to it. And I've kind of summarized this letter on this slide. The purpose of the letter is, is after the audit is to communicate to the, the Board of Trustees certain areas of the audit just so they're aware of kind of the overall results of our, us performing, performing the engagement. First area talks about qualitative aspects of accounting practices on page one. This, let, this, this area goes over three particular items. One has to do with accounting standards and policies uh, of the district. Um, the other has to do with any significant estimates that are included in your financial statements. And the third area are significant disclosures. Um, looking at the first, first paragraph that talks about the accounting standards, um, there were no new accounting standards adopted this year that were that for the district, so that means there's, there's no significant changes to the report compared to last year. Um, there was a new accounting policy adopted that has to do with accrued compensated absences. Um, you can look at this policy on page 18 of your financial as it's disclosed. Basically, um, the, the district has started to accrue for um, sick and vacation time, 50% of that, and that's all outlined in the disclosure. Significant estimates of the district, there is depreciation. That's a standard estimate that's included in most financial statements with, with um, capital assets. Um, again, that's the, that's the um, theory of you purchase uh, you know, an, an asset, it could be a fixed asset, it could be your structures, equipment. Um, those assets are, are looked at and estimated what their useful life is, and then that purchase is expensed over that useful life. Um, so you're going to have a depreciation expense in your financial statements, and this is a non-cash out expense. The, usually those capital assets have already been purchased and the cash has gone out in the year that it was purchased, but it's expensed over a number of different years. So you'll see that when we go through the financials. Significant disclosures. Um, there are several disclosures in there that are standard. There haven't been any significant changes to your disclosures, and we don't consider any of them being significant at this point. 
Page two of this letter starts, and you can see them, they're italicized, bold, of the, of the areas that we're required to communicate. Um, if we had difficulties um, performing the audit, if there were corrected or uncorrected mis misstatements as we performed our procedures on some of the financial information, if we had disagreements with management, if there were other management representations or any consultations as that occurred when we were performing the audit. This is the, this is the type of letter that if we had any of those, and you can see on, on the uh, slide that we had, didn't have any issues with the, with the audit or disagreements or any of those type of findings um, after we performed, after we completed the audit. We do have one uncorrected misstatement. It's in the financials and it's a, a duplicate um, from, from last year. And this has to do with the OPEB um, connection with the health insurance. Uh, the district purchases health insurance and the health insurance actually provides a benefit for the employees to be able to purchase the insurance after they've retired. Um, this benefit has been, has been slated as um, uh, an OPEB benefit, meaning after employment benefit for the employees. Uh, when we reviewed the uh, liability that's supposed to be recorded on the financial statements, it was, we deemed it immaterial. Um, the second point, which I think I brought up last year over the Zoom, was that um, at any point in time, the district can terminate the, the um, health insurance purchase with its carrier. So it kind of leaves, uh, um, you know, it leaves this, this liability to suddenly, if we were to record it on your financials, it would suddenly go away because you wouldn't have that benefit anymore. So until we, we've been tracking this liability and until it becomes significant and material to the financial statements, we've been advising management not to record it. Um, because it is a liability though, it is disclosed in your financial statements and you can see that as note eight, page 21 of your financials. So you are disclosing this. We are, you are disclosing this to your readers. Um, you're just not recording it at this point as an actual liability in your financials. Does anybody have any questions on this letter? Um, just to clarify, OPEB is other post-employment benefits. Correct. Okay, and the liability stems from our offering as a district to former employees to buy into the same insurance, correct? If, if you're a member of the trust that you're buying your, your, the insurance from, they offer that benefit to the employees as long as you continue to purchase that insurance from the trust, that if when they retire, um, they can, you know, when they retire, they can, they can continue to purchase insurance. Now, when they do that, that isn't any cost to the district. They have to they have to pay for the full okay, amount. That's but, what I wanted to. But generally sure. speaking, you, when you get when you know when you uh, retire from a job, you you cannot purchase insurance in most cases. Okay, so the liability comes from not money we've already spent or intend to spend. It's just in the form of a benefit. It's a, it's part of the package with the health insurance. Yes. Any other questions? The last line on the slide, other matters, I, I just wanted to bring to the trustee's attention. There is one other report that you're required to file. Um, I have a copy of it right here, and, and um, David has a copy of it. Uh, it's just from the state of Maine. They require you to submit your financial statements directly to them when they're issued, and we, that has already been done. Just to go back, Dave, for page 18, when it's talking about compensated absences, the 50% payout for sick leave and such for terminated employees, but what about retired employees? Is, is it the same percentage rate or is it different? Same percentage rate. Okay, thank you. So now we'll take a look at the financial statements. 
I've got a slide here of just the table of contents. Um, the financial presentation starts out with the auditor's report. That's our opinion letter. And we have, we have issued an unmodified opinion on the financials, which is, which is a clean opinion for the district. The second part of your financials is a document called the management's discussion and analysis. This is just a summary of information and highlights certain things that occurred during the year. So when readers read the financial, they have an area to kind of get a summary of all the changes in the financial statements. Following that are the actual exhibits, the statements and um, supplemental information. Starts out with the statements of net position. This is the assets and liabilities of the district as of December 31st. Um, these, these statements are comparative, so you're, you can compare numbers from 2021 to 2020. The second statement uh, is the revenue expenses and changes in net position. And changes in net position is a, is a term similar to profit or loss. Um, but this statement shows revenues um, and the expenses for the year, and then the change in the net position or the profit and loss. Uh, the, expenses, the expenses are are grouped based on cost areas of the district. And you can see down the line here, there are schedules of these operating expenses that break these out to natural expense categories in the back of the financial. Following the revenue expenses is the statement of cash flows. Um, this is a required statement um, under, the, under your financial reporting and it, and it basically eliminates some of the accruals and other non-cash activities so you can see the direct change in cash um, for the district. Following those statements are the notes to the financials. This will outline your, your policies, your accounting policies and, and certain other um, areas that provide a little bit more detail to some of the numbers you're finding on the financial statements. Then as I said, the schedules of operating expenses and, and also attached is the superintendent's report. So not, not, a lot of, not a lot of changes to these statements compared to last year. So we're gonna look at the statement in net position that's on page 12, that will be our first statement. And again, I've, some of these slides are um, summarizing this information into um, graphs and other categories. So you can kind of see some of the trends. I'm gonna flip over to it here. So the way this statement's set up, you have the assets at the top and then following those are the liabilities and then the net position, which is the equity in the district. Um, I have got a, I've got a slide here looking at the growth of assets. Um, it's grouped these that, that follow along your financial statements with cash, investments, account receivable inventory, and other assets. Um, as you can see, there's been considerable growth in the investments. I think that has to do with um, a lot of the deposits from, excuse me. Yeah, it's, it's, it's primarily mostly the capital reserve, the, the capacity reserve. Um, that had a, a tremendous growth this year, about 1.4 million. So most of that went into the investments um, along with a little bit of the cash. So you've seen a, a pretty hefty spike um, compared to last year. Cash is, is gonna be related somewhat to the accounts receivable. So accounts receivable are services provided to um, the customers uh, of the district and you know, what they owe the district. Um, generally, you'll see cash go up and down as your receivables go up and down. So when you have a significant increase in receivables, you'll, the general trend is to see your cash drop down um, because you're actually paying for expenses in real time with your own cash until you can collect it from your customers. Um, unless there's significant changes to your rate, 
or significant changes to consumption, I would, I would uh, looking at those receivables continuing to be pretty consistent um, and they will remain consistent until those, some of those changes occur. So that trend I, I think is uh, reasonable um, looking at the receivables. Inventory, that's, that's a small spot on this graph and you can see that it's jumped a little bit in 2021. Generally what the, what the district holds are just materials and supplies to, to run its operations. Most you know, significant inventory such as, as pipe or, or materials used for repairs, the district doesn't normally hold a lot of those type of items. So you can see from, you know, from 2017 to 21, it's been fairly consistent. 2021, it did increase because the district purchased some pipe at the end of the year due to cost increases. And um, that came in for some projects in 2022. So at the end of the year, there was, um, you know, a liability or payable um, for that pipe and, and that pipe's recorded in, as an in inventory. That'll drop down as it's used and be probably capitalized as some of your projects. Any questions with that? Now, because one of the, the larger items as an asset is your capital assets, which is represented uh, all of the structures underground and above ground, um, there is a detail of that we'll see in the notes on, on page 19. But I've put it on a separate graph just to kind of show a relationship with the debt. So you see a downward trend um, with your capital assets. Um, even though you purchase, you're purchasing um, certain amount of or capitalizing certain amount of assets every year, you can still see this downward trend. That's, that's the depreciation I talked about earlier. That's your expensing those capital assets. So the downward trend is a, is a reasonable trend looking at this. Same with the debt. You can see that's going down and that's always a good thing when your debt goes down. That's just your normal payments on that debt on the bonds and, and, and other items. I will, I will also add um, for the capital assets. These are, these are on your financial statements recorded at cost. So it's what you paid for and is what's recorded on your financials. That doesn't necessarily indicate if there's any market value um, to the district's land or buildings or anything like that. So that's just recorded at cost. Looking at the liabilities, um, you know, generally speaking, the, the, the district doesn't have a lot of current liabilities as they're, they're paid at a normal pace. Um, so this graph is a little, looks a little, um, skewed in, in a way because the, the numbers are, are definitely much smaller, but you can see these on your financial statements. Um, you know, the, these, these are normal trends, accounts payable, crude payroll, and I should say compensated absences, um, interest and credits that the district has. Um, credits are, are fairly minor and accrued interest you can see is, is going down as that debt is being paid off. Um, spikes here with accounts payable going up. That again is the purchase of the inventory. So generally speaking, it's, you know, between 160,000, 180,000, but it spiked up just one year for the purchase at the end of the year. And there's, you can see the effect of, um, the accrued compensated absences. Um, those went up when the policy changed to actually accrue that liability, um, going forward. So with your current liabilities and your current assets, um, we can look at the current ratio, um, comparing current assets to current liabilities. Again, the, the theory is can you cover, can you cover all your current liabilities with the current assets you have? Um, still even with the change in the policy and accruing um, the compensated absences, 
the district is for 2021 is still 3.4 to 1. That means you, you can pay your liabilities almost three and a half times. So it's still very good current ratio. And I'll say this like I do every year, the benchmark that shows a healthy district is on the order of what, one to two to one? Well, I, districts, districts usually are a little bit higher than that as a, as a normal industry trend. Um, I just kind of compare it to just a, a regular for-profit company out there. If they're ever, ever going to expand and, and need some financing, that's generally what most financial institutions are around, 1.2. 1, 1 Obviously, there are always new products out there when you're looking at financial institutions, but generally that's, what they, that's probably the minimum they like to see is 1.2 to, to 1, meaning you can at least cover your current assets along with you know, the debt that, that you're going to incur and having those, those costs. At the bottom of the page is the statement of net position. And I just have a small graph with that. So when you look at that, the district's net position is $27,755,000 at the end of the year. But what this graph shows is that about almost $17 million of that is invested in capital assets. This means it's unspendable. It's, it's all of the assets you have in the ground and, and above ground. So kind of gives you an idea of, although you have this equity, uh, overall equity in the district, there's, there's a, about 17 million that's not in, it's not liquid per se. Um, the other 8.4 million that's, that's classified as board designated, those are your reserve funds. So out of all the rest of the assets, you have about 8.4 million that's, that's been designated to certain reserve funds on the district's um, books. And that leaves about 2.3 million of unrestricted or spendable cash at the end of the year. I don't have a slide for the cash flows, but I, I don't know if everybody's looking at them, but I can go over it real quick. Um, just to kind of how to read this, as it's a, it's a little bit of a different financial, it's a little bit of a different financial statement. So again, the cash flows are looking at, you know, the basic cash inflows and outflows. So when you look at this and you see brackets around the numbers, that's a cash outflow. Um, when, you, when you see positive numbers, that's the cash inflow. So it's, it's broken down into three areas, operating activities, invest, investing activities, and uh, capital and financing activities. Um, skipping over the investment activities in the middle, you, you look at the top. So the cash flow from operating activities um, is, is about 1.3 million, pretty similar to last year. So not a lot of changes there. This is just your basic operations, your, the fees that are, are being charged to the customers, um, the amounts you're paying vendors, and the amounts you're paying for salaries. You compare that to the, the, the capital and financing related activities. So this is about a million dollars going out. So you had 1.3 coming in, a million dollars going out. This is for purchase of capital assets, payments on your bonds, and um, some other minor, minor things going on in there, but that's pretty much what the majority of it's made up of. So when you look at that, you're looking at, um, you know, about a $200,000, we'll call it profit or change in net assets. However, your cash dropped about a half million dollars, 550,000, right around there. The reason for that has to do with the middle area, which is your investments. So. You, you brought in all of those capacity upgrade fees and a majority of those went into um, the investments. You can see that as purchase of investments that's, that's on there. Um, obviously, as your port portfolio changes, it will have, it'll be buying and selling assets if they mature. Um, and that's what the $3 million on there is, is that cash becoming available and then they turn around and invest it into more investments. Uh, 
So I would say that, you know, the biggest part of, um, you know, that change in, in net loss is I think some of the cash that you had on hand last year actually is now in your investments. Um, so that's, that's kind of how you want to read that, that statement. Any questions of that? Looking at, um, oops, I skipped over. I'm going to go back to page 13. This is your statements of revenues and expenses. So again, this is just showing the revenues and expenses for um, operating and then also non-operating revenues. Um, I've just got this, this um, slide just to kind of show the user fees and how they're increasing. Um, they went up about $200,000 this year based on usage and, and new customers added to the district. Um, Expenses, you can see, also went up about $200,000. So it was $4.1 million last year compared to four point three. million. And again, these cost centers that are, that are under operating expenses, these have the supplemental schedules in the back of the financial that actually break out those numbers into, into natural, category, natural expense categories. Then you have some non-operating rev revenue and expenses. These aren't, aren't very um, material to your financials, but it does show your, your interest on your bond, bonds and debt and um, also your investment return for the year. Those all come down to um, you know, a, a loss of about three, 365000 um, after you consider the operating and the non-operating revenues and expenses. And then the financial will show the, the contributions of the capacity upgrade fees um, of about $1.7 million, the developer contributions and the upgrade fees. That brings up the change in net position to about $1.3 million for the year. Any questions on those statements? I'll just do a, a few quick highlights on the notes in the back. Um, and certainly if you have questions, um, I'll, 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 we'll go through whatever area you're looking at. Um, so pages 16 through 18, these are your summary of your accounting policies. Again, no significant changes from last year except for um, the compensated absences, which is disclosed in your financial. Page 18 um, discloses your investments, um, U.S. Treasury notes and mutual funds. This will show the market value, um, which is what's been adjusted to in your financials for your investments. Page 19 has to do with your capital assets. Uh, this gives you a, a little bit better breakdown of that large number on your, on your statement of net position. Um, it shows additions, retirement, uh, retirements for the year, and also your depreciation, which is about $1.6 million. Page 20 has to do with your bonds payable. Um, you have one bond left. Uh, it's, it's being reduced by about $430,000 every year. Um, this does show in the middle of the page what's going to be required for the next two years, and then it should be paid off. The next, the next few pages, um, 20, 21, and 22, these are more, more non-financial information that's required to be disclosed. It talks about pension plans that the district has for its employees, um, if there's any business or credit risks, um, which there aren't any. Um, any open leases that's out there, uh, that's, that's on note seven on page 21. Note eight is that post-retirement benefits um, disclosure that we have that just discloses to the reader what, what the current liability is. It's about 147,000. Um, and then note nine has to do with commitments and then uh, general disclosure at the end on 22. 
talking about the COVID pandemic. Any final questions? I don't have any. Anyone else? <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Do we need a motion to approve that? Well, I should first. Why don't you do that then? Do my annual Good report because it's all one document. So uh, as part of our annual audit is the annual report that I put together for the board and the town. <coughs> Excuse me. And so uh, I'm just going to hit the highlights on this. Uh, the document will be both the audit and annual report will be uh, posted on our website and available to all who wish to uh, read it in detail. Um, and, at, and on our website already are our, our past audits. I can't, I don't remember how far back we go, but fair, no, fair number of them. You know, I think as, as, as far as I have been here. So anyway, uh, in 2021, uh, the district uh, provided wastewater collection and treatment for approximately 5,500 accounts, an increase of uh, 91 accounts of which uh, 5,000 of them were residential and the remaining 450 were commercial. Uh, through these accounts, we provide serv uh, service to uh, about 7,150 residential equivalent users. Uh, equivalent user um, is equal to basically one uh, single family home. And uh, 2,840 uh, commercial equivalent uses. Let's see, in addition to those that are connected to the district collection system, the district provided uh, treatment for another 57 customers that utilized uh, the sanitary district for septage disposal. In 2021, we uh, uh, issued uh, 204 permits for sewer connections. Um, you know, an increase of about 60 from 2020. Uh, we had both private and public sewer, uh, sewer extensions. Um, we had approximately 3,300 feet of, uh, of private gravity sewer and almost 200 feet of um, two inch force main, 2,600 feet of four inch force main. And then on the um, public side, we had uh, 3,200 feet of 8-inch gravity sewers, uh, 1,000 feet of 12-inch sewer, and 11, uh, 1,300 feet of uh, pressure sewers, and another 38 manholes. As of 2021, the district owns and operates approximately uh, 380 feet of gravity sewer, 130 feet of force main, 2,200 manholes, um, 25 pump stations, 24. Um, and a two and a half million gallon per day wastewater treatment facility. In addition to our infrastructure, there's a, a significant number of um, amount of private infrastructure in the town, of which is about 42,000 feet of private uh, gravity sewer, 40,000 feet of private force main, and 35 private pump stations. We employ 12 full-time employees, counting myself. Um, and we are responsible for the collection, treatment, plant operation, responding to customer needs, inspecting all new sewer installations, and conducting the district financial activities. The district's total budget, including capital expenditures for 2021, was $5,488,240, up uh, 596,972 from uh, 2020 budget at an average cost of treatment of uh, a penny per gallon. The increase in the budget was due to several large capital projects, including a force main replacement, auto control replacement, and several uh, pump station generators. And I listed the, a more detailed list of those in the, are included in the back. Uh, we treated on average about 1.38 million gallons per day, and overall, um, we treated 509 million gallons of wastewater for the year. 
with an average removal of 96% and 99% of BOD and TSS. Um, I did, let's see, we, in, in 2021, we treated, uh, as I previously said, 57,000 gallons of septage, which is down from years past. Uh, and we, we also hauled off about 2,000 wet tons of um, uh, dewatered sludge. Yes, last year the district budgeted uh, approximately 1.5 million for capital expenditures, uh, including um, uh, pump station design, force main replacements, sk uh, skater, hardware and software upgrades, PLC upgrades, boiler, and several generators throughout the a more detailed list uh, is provided also. In closing, the district remains dedicated to efficient treatment of the Scarborough's wastewater and protection of our marshes, rivers, and oceans. It's the core of our existence. I would like to express my appreciation to the trustees and the sanitary district staff, town manager, and his staff, and the citizens of Scarborough for their support during 2021. With that, I can ask for a motion. All right. So, any questions for the superintendent on his report? Any report? I'll entertain a motion to approve both the audit and the annual report, please. Thank you, Jason. Excellent. Second. Any more discussion? Barring none, all in favor? None opposed. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Enjoy the weekend. Cool. So, um, 2022 budget amendment. As discussed at the last trustees meeting, the town received bids for the proposed work on the Gorham Road. Um, which includes the replacement of our force main from Maple Ave to the river, Nonsense River. The project came in over budget. The final cost for the district came in at uh, 1,259,550, um, which is $360,000 over our budgeted 900,000 um, uh, budgeted line item for this. I recommend am amending the line item within the 2020 budget for this work from 900,000 to 1,325,000, which includes an additional 5% for contingencies. Thank you, Jason. We got Mike on the second, thank you. Any questions, discussion? All in favor? None opposed, thank you. Ooh. Budget summary. The four month budget summary is included in your packet. I recommend approval. I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Thank you, Ben. Second. Thank you, Jason. Any questions for the superintendent on the budget summary? Barring none, all in favor? None opposed, thank you. All right, the additional item of Key Bank Fraud Protection. Uh, this past week, um, a, the, the district uh, um, discovered and uh, prevented a, uh, some check fraud at our, uh, our bank. Somebody had fraudulent reproduced one of our checks, uh, wrote it for uh, $2,300, $2,400, and tried to cash it. The, the um, safety measures we have in place, positive pay, um, we, were, we uh, were able to stop that fraud. We did have a discussion with the bank uh, as soon as we discovered it, and in reviewing our, uh, our fraud protection, 
they came back and uh, suggested an additional ACH debit fraud filter, uh, which I included the information on. on the, um, and I would I recommend uh, authorizing the treasurer to execute these documents to add this ACH debit fraud filter. There are two documents that were included in the packet that I left on your table. I have a motion to uh, dedicate the treasurer to, to execute this agreement. I know you. I know you're not. That's why I'm Motion looking. To thank you, Ben. Joe. Joe. Thank you, Joe. Second. Thanks, Ben. Any questions? Go ahead, Ben. I'd, I'd just like to better understand the fees. It's forty forty-five dollars per month, and then there's a three cent charge and a five dollar charge and a ten dollar charge. Just the, trying uh, to understand what that all that means. Uh, the the. <laughs> I'm not quite sure I completely understand it either. Um, you know, maybe you could speak towards that, Wendy. Do you, do you remember the details on it? The $5 charge is when we set up the, uh, the vendors that will come in and draw the money out. And she's waiving those fees for, for a couple of months, I believe, to set mm -hmm. that up. But anyone's fees after that, it's a $5 one-time fee. Three cents per, per check seven. for payee verification. Right, that is through Cluster Pay, I believe, is what that does. Is that through Cluster Pay? That uh, we are able to package both positive pay and ACH direct um, EPA total cost uh, of three cents per check payee verification cost. Yeah. What? what So there's there's a five dollar, and I'm trying to remember the, the conversation in detail. Um, there was a, they, they were going to waive the five dollar authorization set up for our current checks that go out via ACH already, and I believe there was like 45, 47 of them. We do like 31 a month. And then any that we add as time marches on is that $5 fee to set them up. So that's a, a one-time add, and we might add one or two a month maybe? No. no. Not we even? We, what we have is very consistent. We don't. Okay. And what are force paid checks? Again, it would be a very rare occurrence. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Is it our policy that we have to write checks and be signed them? Is that why we send out I mean, 47 checks a month versus just an ACH transfer? We do, well, the ACA, the, it's 35, I think you said. Those are those aren't uh, signed directly signed by uh, Jason. There, there's a uh, form after after the fact that he signs. But other than that, all of the checks that the treasurer does sign when they go out. I guess I'm not familiar. Is that our policy, or is that a control within our accounting? Even though our account just left. <laughs> I think it's just a uh, procedure that we've always. Followed. I've, I've, there's not a written policy that requires that. Gotcha. I think that we've been doing this historically yeah, for exactly. separation of powers and, and mm -hmm. responsibilities, so that one, just one person, doesn't have control of everything. The monies. Yeah. Part of this, the trustee. Uh, but <coughs> so nothing's being passed on to our users as far as this cost goes. 
No. Yeah, I mean, this would be absorbed under our operation costs. Yeah. So, over so overall for the year, we're looking at 300 bucks a year? Yeah, 500, I'd say. You know, 10 yeah, times 45 would be, you know, five seven hundred dollars And this fraudulent check was worth $2,400? $2, Seems like a good investment. Additional question, was the person apprehended or was it done during, via wire transfer or online? Or? Uh, we had conversations with the bank. The bank is following up on it. I don't know. I'm sure the, the location, address, and name are all false, so probably not. Go ahead, Joan. Curiosity, do we know if the town enlists in the same type of thing? I don't. You know, positive pay I know is quite common. I think you use we it. We do it. Um, and that was something that we actually just picked up the last year or two, I believe. Forge a check. Okay. Any more questions for the superintendent? All in favor? None opposed. Thank you, folks. All right. Public comments. Any members of the public want to speak? All right. We'll start with trustee comments then. Ben. Uh, that, that was a good meeting. Uh, the audit report seemed really good. Uh, thank you to all the staff at the district. And... Uh, that's it. Joe. No, I'd like to thank uh, Willette Associates again for a great audit and uh, the administration staff for uh, helping them out with that. I know it's very time consuming for Wendy and Serena. Um, so I'd like to thank them for that and a great audit. And the staff is, as always, for continued great work and wish everybody a happy and safe memorial week. Mike. Um, I'm going to echo very similar comments. I'd like to th thank Mike, Mike Dunn uh, from Ouellette coming in to make his presentation. It was, it was very informative. And, um, and yes, I do know that uh, these audits take a lot of time with, with the staff. So, uh, so thank you. Oh. Congrats on a great audit. Happy Memorial Day. That's it for me. Ruth. Thank you to all of you for the work that you did on that audit, because I know it doesn't come together overnight. So you've got a great staff. So thank you very much for everything that you all do um, for Scarborough. So I appreciate it. Jason. Sound like a broken record, but I'll say it anyway. Thanks again to Mike and Willette Associates, uh, Mike and Willette Associates for coming in and presenting on the audit and a huge thanks to Wendy and the rest of the staff for all of their contributions towards the audit. It, it is a lot of work and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Cool. All right. Um, kudos to Wendy and Serena for doing a great job and helping out Willett and Associates on their audit. And thanks to Carl and Paul on getting the Vapex unit in. And I wish everyone a safe Memorial Weekend. Um, with that, I'll entertain the final motion of the evening. Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Jason. Second. Thank you, Ben. All in favor? We're done. Thank you.